The first story features an American fisherman named Blake Williams and his encounter with a very aggressive great white shark. Blake is off to sea with three other fishermen named Charlie, Andrew, and Jack to fish for some tuna. The three were on their boat and ready to lower their first net. While Blake and Jack watched, Andrew and Charlie were the first to drop the net. When they felt their neck become heavy after the first couple of minutes, they decided to lift it and saw they had caught a decent number of tuna. Once Blake and Jack had lowered the second net, the men were satisfied with their catch. They first moved to a different ocean area to increase their tuna catches. Blake and Jack then dropped the second net afterward. Upon lowering the second net, Jack could sense something wrong with the water. He felt as if there was something huge moving underneath the waters in front of them. Hey Blake, I feel like there's something wrong with this part of the sea, Jack stated as Blake gave him a smug look. There's nothing wrong here, Jack. Only if you do something dumb, then there is something wrong, Blake replied as the two of them shared a good laugh after lowering the second net. The two fishermen first waited a few minutes before testing to see if the net was too heavy to lift. Blake decided to check it on his own as Jack sat on the boat floor. When Blake held the trap underneath the water, he was surprised to see that it was heavy. He wanted to tell Jack about it, but he decided to lift it himself. As soon as he lifted the net, an aggressive great white shark jumped from the water with its jaws open wide, attempting to bite Blake's hand. Blake immediately released the net from his hands as he stepped back in pure shock. Jack, Andrew, and Charlie were all startled by the attack as they approached Blake to ask if he was okay. While they were talking to Blake, the shark jumped from the water again, and this time it tried to bite off Blake's leg. Luckily, Jack managed to pull him away from the boat's edge beforehand. Seconds later, they felt a loud thump from underneath the boat and realized that it was the shark again, frustrated as he didn't get a chance to bite Blake's hand or leg. The shark kept bumping underneath the boat as the four fishermen held on for their lives. Charlie, who was in charge of maneuvering the boat, managed to get to the steering wheel and immediately started the engine to drive away from the shark. Blake, Andrew, and Jack kept holding on to the boat as it moved away from the shark. Looking back, Blake realized that the angry shark was still following them, so he ordered Charlie to speed up. The shark just disappeared underneath the waters after a few minutes, leaving the four of them with the most terrifying experience they'd had in their many years of fishing. People are usually scared of the unknown. And one of the biggest unknowns that humanity has still not explored to the fullest is the ocean. The ocean harbors a variety of primordial life that can kill anyone easily. But few strike fears into the hearts of humans as sharks do. Sharks are one of the oldest predators in the world's oceans. They have remained unchanged, perfect, and as hungry as ever. The ferocity of a provoked shark is a force of nature on its own something that Emma Ferguson would find in her deadly encounter with an annoyed bull shark at her local aquarium. Story 1 Emma Ferguson, a college student studying engineering in Columbus, Ohio, intended to switch schools once her pre-engineering program was up. She had always wanted to be a marine biologist, but some personal issues held her back from that dream, so she took up the next best degree, according to her parents' wisdom, engineering. Although she enjoyed the courses and had no issues passing her finals, she didn't feel fulfilled from the experience. She was not the most popular girl, but she had a close-knit friend group that preferred to spend their time indoors playing Dungeons & Dragons or video games. One of her friends, Marco, worked in a zoo near their city and would often bring his friends in after hours to enjoy the animals without concern for other people being a bother. One day, Marco invited Emma and another friend, May, to visit the zoo late at night because they were installing two new exhibits in the aquarium, a shark tank and a seal enclosure. Emma and May jumped at the opportunity as it seemed exciting, so they met Marco at the zoo the following night. Arriving at the zoo, Emma and May found it creepy since no people were around, but Marco was comforting. 
Men were working on the enclosures with the animals still in them, so they elected to walk around the zoo until the work was done. They visited various enclosures but were disappointed that their favorite animals were sleeping. However, nocturnal animals were a sight as they roamed freely around their enclosures. After about an hour of walking around the zoo, the trio returned to the newest exhibit and marveled at the size of the shark tank and how cute the seals were. These animals were understandably stressed from transport and seemed to be on edge, but the group didn't register this as they were still in awe. The girls walked up to the seals and admired them and their fat little bodies, while Marco took a special interest in the sharks. As the girls looked at the seals, Marco climbed up the small platform to the top of the shark tank, which had a flimsy plastic lid to keep it shut, likely to make feeding easier for the keepers. Marco was a keeper, but he had been on the job for only a few months and usually kept to the reptile enclosures. He snapped open the lid in one section of the tank and stared into it. When May called him out on this stupid decision, he told them to climb up with him and check it out. May refused outright, but Emma was curious and climbed the platform despite her friend's warnings. When she reached the top, she was amazed at the sharks and how gracefully they were gliding through the water below them. They whispered among themselves about how elegant they looked and seemed so close. Emma, seemingly entranced, slowly reached out for the water to feel its temperature. It felt cold, shockingly so. She dug deeper into the tank as the sharks congregated at the bottom. There were three of them in total, three massive bull sharks. She turned her gaze toward Marco with tears in her eyes. She told him she regretted not pursuing her dream of studying marine life as originally intended. She said the moment the two of them shared could have been her day-to-day -day life, but she was stuck doing something she hated. Marco hugged her and said things always turned out well, but they didn't consider that one of the sharks was getting much closer to the top of the tank. The two turned back to look at the tank, and Emma pulled her still hand back. The sudden movement caused the shark to flex in the water and surge towards Emma's arm. It was too fast. Emma screamed as the shark clamped down its strong jaws on the middle of her forearm, pulling her to the floor above the tank. Marco held her up and didn't let the shark's weight pull her into the tank, only making her scream worse. Sharks usually let go of their prey after the first bite, but these sharks were stressed and hungry, so it only held on to her out of desperation for a meal. It pulled harder and harder until Emma felt the most shocking and burning pain she had ever felt in her life. Degloved. The skin from her forearm gave way and followed the shark's teeth into the cold water. Emma shrieked as her arm burned, but passed out from all the pain. Marco pulled her back from the tank, panting and throwing up at the sight of the mangled tendons and blood still dripping from her skinless arm. He told May to call an ambulance right after Emma got bit, so they were on their way. He gripped the part of her arm that still had skin with all his might to staunch the bleeding while May ripped up her hoodie to apply a tourniquet to her arm. They succeeded and the blood stopped flowing, but Emma was still not responding to them. They could hear paramedics running through the zoo hallways to get to them, since they were in an urban area and the ambulance's response time was remarkably short. This speed ended up being the only reason Emma survived the incident, as she started to go into shock. They carried her off to the vehicle and left Marco and May on the ground in their urgency. May slapped Marco for letting her do something stupid, but Marco broke down in sobs. They sat there for 30 minutes, unsure of what to do. Ultimately, they went to the hospital to see their friend, but it took a week for her to stabilize enough to talk to anyone. She pulled through the incident, with her doctors claiming she would have to get grafts to mend the damaged skin. However, the psychological scars never healed, and Emma developed an irrational fear of fish and large animals, which crippled her desire to be a marine biologist. Marco lost his job and decided to quit college due to the depression that set in after he blamed himself for Emma's incident. Even though Emma forgave him for what happened, they cut ties and moved on with their lives. Nolan is a 17-year-old stand-up paddleboard student in California. He's been learning how to paddleboard for weeks now 
and he's surprisingly amazing and faster than the other students at his young age. One day, he went to the beach after he headed home from school, bringing his stand-up paddleboard and paddle with him. He doesn't have a class today, but wants to try paddleboarding himself. He wanted to see how far he could go without Caroline's supervision. When he saw that the waves at sea looked good to surf or paddleboard on, he immediately started paddleboarding against them. He held firm onto his paddle and began to go against the waves, which he successfully went through. He was satisfied that he was doing great, and all his paddleboarding lessons went well. He decided to return to the shore when something weird began to happen. As Nolan was paddling through the sea, he felt something weird underneath him. It was as if there's something big swimming underneath the paddleboard at the moment. He paused for a while and took a deep breath, when surprisingly, a great white shark sprung out of the water and attempted to bite him. The shark got back underwater and attacked Nolan again, throwing him off the paddleboard. Nolan panicked as he quickly picked up his paddle and swam through the water, when suddenly the shark charged toward him and tried to bite his leg. But he luckily managed to kick the shark's face before it did. He felt relieved for a second until the shark returned to him again and attempted to bite his leg for the second time. Unfortunately, the shark got a hold of Nolan's leg and began to chew it violently, which caused it to bleed underwater. Nolan tried to kick the shark's face with all his effort using his other leg. He knew he would drown if the shark wouldn't stop biting him, so he kept kicking its face. When he realized that the paddle he was holding was a solid and heavy object, he used it to hit the shark's face repeatedly. The shark began to flinch, but Nolan could still feel its teeth against his skin, so he kept hitting the animal with the paddle until it decided to let his leg go and swim away. Nolan could feel the pain in his leg, but he managed to climb back to his paddleboard and paddle back safely to the shore. Luckily, a lifeguard noticed him immediately and decided to bring him to the hospital, where he was advised to rest until his leg was fully recovered from the severe shark bite. After the attack, the beach was temporarily closed and will remain closed until the shark warnings are lifted and people can swim again without the danger of being attacked by a shark just like it did to Nolan. Sarah Jameson Our first story occurred in Palm Beach, Florida on July 13, 1997. Palm Beach is a fantastic location for any swimming or diving enthusiast looking for a good time. Sarah Jameson was a free diver from Delaware that wanted to enjoy the Floridian sights and activities, so she decided to spend one summer in Florida working on Palm Beach and enjoying her free time in the water. The summer went smoothly as she relished her work as a waitress and made some friends with her co-workers. Diving was a regular occurrence where Sarah went for one diving session every few days, but July 13th would be her last. In the early morning, Sarah walked to the cafe where she worked and started a shift. Amy, her friend and diving partner, said that she felt a bit nervous about their diving session in the afternoon because there was talk about a shark being sighted a few miles north from where they usually went swimming. Sarah was skeptical about the shark since it was so far away, so she convinced Amy that they should still go to their regular session and there was nothing to worry about. Later in the day, Sarah and Amy met up at the beach, bags in hand and diving gear ready. They were casual divers, so they never ventured too far out from the shore, and they usually dove down to where they felt most confident. Sessions never lasted longer than two hours, as they both had obligations to attend to during the day. When they arrived at the beach, quite a few people enjoyed the afternoon sun and having fun in the water. They left their things near the water and jumped in, as their shift at the cafe was particularly exhausting. After a bit of swimming, Amy suggested they should go a bit further out than last time because of all the people at the beach. Amy's words about the shark sighting from before lingered in Sarah's mind, but she agreed, and they swam out a few dozen yards. They commenced their dive and went down further than ever, as the deeper water meant a lower seafloor. The water was clear, and Sarah felt free swimming and looking for exciting things, as always. Through training, she learned to hold her breath for up to six minutes, 
but Amy wasn't as seasoned, so she had to frequently return to the surface. At one point, Amy tapped Sarah on the shoulder and pointed up to indicate that she needed air. So Sarah just nodded and kept swimming. She was awed by the number of seashells in the sand, and she spotted some kelp a bit further from her, so she decided to check it out. As she got closer to the flora, she noticed the water was considerably colder at this point and that there was movement near the kelp. Believing it to be fish, she swam up to get a closer look. By this point, she noticed her lung capacity was slowly reaching its limit that she would have to surface soon, but she decided to investigate the movement and then leave. As she got closer to the kelp, the dark, moving mass became more evident, and just as her blood turned colder than the water around her, she realized she was face to face with a giant bull shark. The shark moved through the kelp, and Sarah could see its black dead eyes as it seemingly curved its movement and shot straight for, maw open and ready to eat. Sarah was frozen in fear, knowing she couldn't swim away from the beast, so she extended her arms and hoped for the best. To Sarah's amazement, the shark did not latch onto her arms, but moved and clamped down on her thigh instead. The pain was searing, and she barely managed to scream, knowing that losing her remaining breath meant her life would be snuffed out. Through the grimaces and flailing, she concentrated her thoughts on one thing, the gills. Sarah knew that shark's gills were very sensitive and that you should target them to get a shark to let go of you. With violent, jarring movements, she jammed her fingers in the shark's gills and pulled with everything she had. She felt the shark's teeth a bit harder and hit bone as its tail flailed in response to Sarah's fingers. The pain was worse than ever, but it quickly subsided as the shark finally released her thigh and disappeared in a red mist. Sarah pushed through the pain. Still worried about where the shark had gone, she swam quickly back to the surface where she had trouble seeing due to her blood in the water. She felt weaker with each second it took to surface. When she finally got back, the warmth of the sun and the fresh air cleared her mind. She shrieked, alerting the people on the beach and Amy, who was floating on her back next to her. She immediately turned over and swam to her friend. They both began to swim back to the shore where people were waiting, confused about the commotion. Sarah was losing consciousness and they were still a dozen yards from the coast, so Amy knew they had to act quickly. As they neared the shore, the beachgoers realized what was happening and they ran into the water to help them, reaching them just in time. Since the beach they were on was close to the city, an ambulance quickly arrived, which took Sarah to the hospital. Luckily, her injuries weren't too severe, but a few more minutes of blood loss would have resulted in her death. Amy stayed with Sarah for her entire stay in the hospital and provided support. She recovered within a few weeks and was back bartending in Palm Beach, but never returned to the water. According to her report on the incident, she developed severe telassophobia, so her only swimming was in pools with clear water and a visible bottom. It's common knowledge that sharks tend to be aggressive animals in fight-or-flight situations. In most cases, the answer will be to fight. This happened to Claudia Montagna when she, her husband, and their six-year-old son went to Australia for a family vacation. The trip was scheduled for August 1972. They usually went skiing in the French Alps but this time they decided to replace the frigid, adrenaline-filled adventure with lounging around on a beach in Perth. This would prove to be a fatal mistake. On their arrival at the airport, they had the entire day to enjoy themselves before checking into their hotel. So they toured the city for a few hours, taking in the sights and interacting with the people. Later in the day, they settled into their hotel room and got ready to visit the local beaches. They got to a clear spot in the sand when, to their surprise, they ran into one of Claudia's friends, who was also vacationing with her husband. They caught up as they hadn't seen each other in a long time, and her friend eventually invited them to a boat touring the coast of Perth, bound for the following day. They all agreed. The rest of the day was spent in quiet comfort. Their son Langan played in the shallows all day, 
and the pair was reminiscing about old memories. The following day, the family met with Claudia's friend, Abigail, and her husband, Elliot. They were all about the same age, so they were not short on common topics and spent the time on the boat in good company. All in all, there were about 20 people on the boat from all walks of life. As the boat was nearing the halfway point, they noticed some commotion at the front of the boat, followed by people screaming. They sat there in confusion as they didn't understand what was going on. But eventually, someone passed the information down the boat, informing them that they had hit an outcropping of rocks and that the hull of the boat was slashed open. The two families were scared senseless and bolted to their seats, unsure of what to do. They heard the tour guide say that they would focus all their energy on pointing the boat toward the shore, but they were still more than two miles out. The emergency services were notified and were on the way, but still a long way out. Claudia held Langan tightly, telling him everything was all right and they would be fine. As the boat started filling up with water, they realized they would have to swim the rest of the way to the shore, as the rescue boats were nowhere to be seen. They eased themselves into the water through the mass of people and swam together, with Abigail and Elliot not far behind. The water was cold and immensely deep. They could feel the current slowly take them further from the shore, but they swam against it. There were quite a few people in the water with them, all of them screaming and arguing with each other. As they swam forward, trying to keep Langan above water, Claudia's husband, Eric, felt something brush by his leg, followed by some discomfort. He pressed on, thinking it was a rock or something similar, never taking his eyes off his wife and child. A few moments later, he was shocked as he heard his wife cry out before being pulled under the surface with their son. He dove down under the surface to see what had happened, only to be met with a haunting sight. At least a dozen bull sharks rapidly swimming through the water, just below the people from the boat. He spotted a red mist directly underneath himself, and there he could see his wife's shocked face as she clutched onto their son. He swam down, hugged them tightly, and started kicking with everything he had. The shark let go of Claudia's leg before this, but Eric knew that it could have returned at any moment. Time was of the essence. They reached the surface of the water, but not before Eric himself felt the sharp teeth of another bull shark latch onto his thigh, ripping the muscles apart before letting go of him as well. He screamed about the threat of sharks in the water, which made all the people around them, Abigail included, scream and panic even more. The rescue boat was in the distance. Their blood was most likely why most of the sharks assembled around them, and Eric started to panic because of the pain in his leg and the feeling of the water surging around them. Claudia screamed in pain again and was pulled into the water again, still holding on to Langan. Eric held her tightly, but to no avail. He was pulled along with them, and he could feel another maw close in on his arm. He flailed around, completely blinded by the salty water, the blood, and the agony of the teeth grinding against his bones. Just as he thought he was going to die, he felt a pair of strong hands grip his arm and yank him out of the water with the shark. The beast let go of his arm as it met the air, and Eric kept screaming about his wife and son, still in the water and nowhere to be seen. He felt his vision fading due to the blood loss, and when he woke up again, he was in a hospital bed. He immediately shot up and started panicking, ripping his IV out of his arm. Abigail and Elliot entered the room, trying to calm Eric down. They informed him that Claudia and Langan did not make it. Their bodies were found somewhere around the site of the attack, but no one would let Eric see them because of his trauma and their state. He cursed the day they decided to go to Australia for their trip and spent the rest of the day sobbing. A few days later, he was discharged and contacted Abigail and Elliot. They helped him tend to his family, and he went back to France alone. Tom Brook had always been fascinated by the ocean. He read many books on marine biology and similar topics in his teenage years. 
Further education on the topic was limited, so the next best thing for Tom was to take up an interest in surfing. He frequently spent his weekends hitting waves with his friends, spending hours in the water surfing and snorkeling. On August 18, 2012, Tom went to the usual beach he and his friends would frequent to have fun. They met up in the morning and planned to swim, eat food, then return to surfing for the rest of the day. When they first entered the water, Tom noted that he didn't feel like his usual self. He felt flush and disoriented, so he lounged on the beach until he felt better. His friends agreed, so they swam around a bit before accompanying their friend to a nearby restaurant to make him feel better. Some friendly banter and pasta later, Tom felt himself again and wanted to start surfing as soon as possible. They got their surfboards ready and paddled a few hundred yards from the beach. Catching waves as a surfer often entails sitting on your board, waiting for the wave to build up to catch it, so that's what they did. Tom noticed his friends were already on a wave while waiting, so he cheered them on. He remained sitting on his board, admiring the agility of his friends and how good they were at surfing. The calm water sloshed around him, and he expected a wave to start forming. But his excitement turned to horror as he looked to the side to see a dorsal fin sticking out of the water, followed by the giant mouth of a bull shark that bit into his leg. He screamed and lost his balance, causing him to flip into the water and get thrown around by the shark. Bull sharks are notorious for being aggressive and persistent with their food, so this was just the tip of the iceberg for Tom. His friends heard the scream and quickly started paddling to his aid, but they were still far off. In excruciating pain, Tom was still under the water, eyes burning because of the salt. The shark was not letting go. He tried to flail around and gouge its eyes, but it was still not giving up. In fact, it seemed as though it only made the shark angrier. By that point, one of the friends arrived at the scene, thrust his hand under the surface and clutched Tom with everything he had. He started pulling while Tom pushed the shark off his leg, and they miraculously managed to get Tom on his friend's board. They both knelt on the board, panting, with Tom moaning in pain. His leg was searing with pain and bleeding profusely. His muscles were ripped and tendons were torn, but Tom insisted on getting to shore as soon as possible. He didn't tell his friend, but he started losing consciousness. They reached the beach in a few minutes to a crowd of onlookers curious about the screaming. His friend helped him stand on one leg while he screamed for someone to call an ambulance. Tom's other friend rushed over and told them that he had already called an ambulance a few minutes away. When he saw the commotion, he swam back to shore to preemptively call emergency services. Thankfully, the ambulance did arrive right on time. The paramedics rushed out and assessed the situation with one of them immediately attending to Tom's wounds to stop the bleeding and stabilize him. It only took him a few minutes, but in the end, they took Tom into the ambulance along with his friends. On the way there, the paramedic told the young men they were brave for doing what they did and that Tom would be fine despite his blood loss. The paramedic was friendly and even cracked a few jokes that eased the tension. When they arrived at the hospital, the paramedics said they would admit him into their care and that the boys could either come back later to check on him or sit in the waiting room. They chose the latter. Eventually, they were informed that Tom was okay and would be released the following day. They helped him get back home with his family and supported him through his recuperation period. He never lost his love for the ocean or surfing, and he understood that the shark was acting on instinct and did not blame it for what happened. In his later years, Tom ended up steering his education toward marine biology, making it his major in college. Our next story takes us to Boa Viagem, Brazil, where Natasha Volkov, a Russian tourist, visited Boa Viagem in the summer of 1998 as a vacation from her stressful job as a nurse in Vladivostok. She was 28 years old, and accompanying her on the trip was her boyfriend, Ilya, who worked as a welder. The two met when Ilya accompanied his friend to the hospital after he burned his hand on some welding equipment. They talked after his friend was taken care of and eventually started dating. The weather in Boa Viagem was terrible during their stay. For the first four days of their one-week vacation, they had a lot of rain, 
that made going outside quite unpleasant, so they just went to restaurants and stayed inside, relaxing. However, on the last three days of their stay, the weather cleared up and presented them with high temperatures and plenty of sun to go to the beach. Natasha was excited to go to the beach, and Ilya shared her enthusiasm. They made it to the beach, and Natasha noticed that a vendor was selling floating mattresses, so she bought one and decided she would float in the water for most of the day and enjoy her time off. Ilya helped his girlfriend blow the mattress up and decided to read a book in the shade and then walk around and have a beer. The water was cold when she entered it since it was still early, around 9 a.m. The couple wanted to maximize their beach time, so they arrived early. Lounging around on the mattress was pure bliss for Natasha, so much so she ended up dozing off and drifted away from shore for a considerable distance. She opened her eyes to a kaleidoscope of colors shifting in her vision due to the intense sunlight, and she realized she had drifted a few hundred yards away from the shore. After the initial wave of panic subsided, she realized that she was on a mattress after all, so she could paddle her way back to the shore with her arms. She even took this as another opportunity to relax, as the sun's heat felt quite nice on her back. This is the point where things went wrong for Natasha Volkov. Something to note about most shark species is that they are quite observant and tend to spot shapes when they are hunting. So the shape of something floating on the surface of the water can be something like a seal or an unknowing woman relaxing. As Natasha got within a hundred yards of shore, she noticed movement underneath her mattress, which caused her to worry. She paddled faster. After a few moments, she felt a strong force bump into her stomach, lifting her about a foot into the air. She yelped in surprise and tried to paddle even faster, but it was in vain. Her mattress was punctured. It started leaking air into the water quickly, and Natasha lost speed. As the surface of the mattress started falling below the surface of the water, Natasha looked up to see the populated beach and its tourists minding their own business. She started crying as she realized that no one knew what was happening and no one was coming to help anytime soon. Her face reached the water and her attacker's presence was made clear by a single thing, a dorsal fin. She saw the bull shark zip past her and a bit further away, so she started flailing and screaming as she swam to shore with everything she had. Some people took notice and pointed Natasha out to the lifeguard on the beach who immediately ran in and started swimming in her direction. She was still some 70 yards away from shore, but her progress was impeded by a searing pain in her right side. The shark had circled and came back to bump into her again. The shark's rough skin caused Natasha to bleed into the water. Not much, but this is a shark we're talking about. The scent of blood in the water heightened the shark's sense of smell, making it more determined and hungry. Seconds later, Natasha felt the shark bite into her thigh, just above her knee, and pull her under the surface. The shark flailed and thrashed as it held Natasha in place, and she exhausted most of her precious breath screaming underwater, so each second was valuable. She tried pushing the shark away from her leg, but it was not letting go. In utter desperation, she started gouging its eyes, scratching them, but that only made her hands bleed. It wasn't until she moved her hands down and pulled the shark's gills that it finally let go of her leg. After one last convulsion, the beast surged past Natasha once more, skidding across her belly and making her bleed even more. By this time, the lifeguard had finally made his way to the victim and pulled her back to the surface. Natasha breathed life back into her lungs and screamed immediately afterward, but the lifeguard held her close and told her to calm down and to hold on to him. He turned and started swimming back to shore quickly, as he understood that time was of the essence and that the shark could have been back at any second. They returned to the shore within a few minutes and Natasha began feeling dizzy due to blood loss. They laid her down and the lifeguard assessed her wounds and decided she needed an ambulance. One was called by a bystander as soon as they saw Natasha's wounds so the sirens could be heard in the distance. During this time, Ilya was walking back to their bags on the beach when he heard the commotion and noticed his girlfriend was attacked by something. 
He dropped his things and immediately ran to help her, pushing through the crowd and helping her stay steady while the ambulance arrived. It got there in a few minutes, and Natasha was swiftly taken to the nearest hospital, and her wounds were tended to. It took her a few hours to stabilize, after which Ilya apologized profusely for not being there to save her from the beast. Natasha remarked that she knew he couldn't swim and didn't want to go into the water. He sat with her for the entirety of her recovery and provided all the support he could, even though she got to walk normally again. He accompanied her to every therapy session and stuck with her to the end, eventually leading to their marriage a few years later. Gabriella works as a shark trader in an animal conservation center and public aquarium in Spain. And yes, you heard it right, she's a shark trainer who trains sharks. Although sharks cannot be domesticated and tamed to keep as pets, they are proven to have the capability to be instructed just like dolphins. The animal conservation center and public aquarium she works in have attracted many people, especially children. Their public aquarium alone has various fish species and, of course, sharks. Gabriella trains two sand tiger sharks named Javier and Alonso. Like most sharks, these sharks are generally docile but get very aggressive when threatened or disturbed. Javier and Alonso were separated from the public aquarium. They had their own enclosure, which visitors could easily visit and see them being fed or trained by Gabriella up close. These sharks have been popular for being smart and well-trained by Gabriella. Javier and Alonso were responsive, but Javier was more responsive to music and Alonso was more responsive to shapes. Experts would also come to the place to witness how Javier and Alonso respond to Gabriella's commands, and they think these sharks can open a door for more trained sharks in the future. And maybe the stereotype about sharks being dangerous and deadly can be long gone by the time people realize that they can be trained to respond like dolphins and not attack humans. One day, Gabriella was informed that a live shark feeding show would feature Javier and Alonso the next day. Gabriella was delighted to know that both sharks would have a live feeding show that can showcase their ability to listen to commands and be as docile as they can. The following day, Gabriella went to work early to see how well the two sharks were doing. As the hours went by, the volume of visitors increased, and they were excited to witness Javier and Alonso. As the show started, Gabriella stood on a platform surrounded by water in the middle of the enclosure. She began to feed Javier and Alonso with small fish and squid, then did a few tricks and commands afterward. The people were amazed by the sharks and their ability to follow Gabriella's orders as they were being fed. When Gabriella ran out of food, the sharks surprisingly started acting weirdly. She tried to give them commands, but they were now not obeying, but rather trying to bump themselves into her platform. The people became confused about why Javier and Alonso were acting strange and out of command. Gabriella explained that maybe they just wanted more food and gave out another order, which surprisingly was obeyed by the sharks this time. Gabriella heaved a sigh of relief, as the people also did. As she was about to walk to the side of the platform to get another food bucket, she accidentally slipped and splashed into the water, falling right into Alonso. The people were shocked as they gasped at what they saw, with Alonso growing aggressive, knowing that he was threatened by how Gabriella fell into the water. Gabriella tried to swim back to the platform when Alonso attacked her and bit her arm. Gabriella was simultaneously shocked and terrified as she did not expect Alonso to act like that. She has trained them and swum with them sometimes, but this is the first time she saw the shark going aggressively at her. The people thought Gabriella had full control of the shark, not until they saw blood in the water and Javier was also going to attack her. Gabriella tried to punch and hit Alonso's face, but it was useless. Alonso kept biting her arm while Javier attacked and bit her leg. Gabriella was helpless as she would be torn apart by the two sharks in a brief moment, and the two sharks had no signs of stopping any time until she was ripped apart. She screamed in pain, feeling her limbs being stretched all at the same time. 
The staff and other trainers immediately rushed to the scene to neutralize the sharks with tranquilizers. After the sharks had been tamed, Gabriella was rescued and brought to the hospital where she was treated. She suffered an injury on her arm and leg and deep bite wounds there. The management of the Animal Conservation Center decided to place Javier and Alonso in a more secluded enclosure and determined whether they should euthanize the sharks or release them into the wild. Gabriella survived the attack despite her injuries, but she would find it hard to walk again till she was fully recovered. The conservation center was temporarily closed until it decided the fate of the two sharks that violently attacked their trainer and left her temporarily disabled. Connor Wright Tourists on vacation can usually be divided into two groups. The leisure types that like to lounge on the beach all day and the thrill seekers that look for new experiences wherever they can find them. Connor Wright, the subject of our next story, falls into the latter group. He was a mechanic from Austin, Texas, who had saved enough money to go to Australia with his friends, something they had discussed for years. On August 2, 2005, Connor, Elliot, and Jack landed in Australia and traveled to their accommodation near Gold Coast, where they would plan their next week's adventures. The first few days were spent taking in the sights and bar hopping to find a good time, with the fourth day of their stay entirely devoted to jet skiing. Connor and Elliot were adrenaline junkies by nature, so they were all for the activity, but Jack insisted that they go and he would spend some time relaxing on the beach. After tries to convince their friend to join them failed, they decided to spend a few hours jet skiing the next day. Neither of them had experienced riding a jet ski before, but both were in the same trade as mechanics, so they understood the basics. After they rented out their jet skis, they tried to convince Jack to join them one last time, but he still wasn't enthused about the idea of the activity. They respected his choice and went for the horizon where there were no swimmers and nothing to bother them. They took a bit to get used to riding the jet skis, but they were speeding across the water surface quickly. The thrill was intense and they would often stop and sit next to each other and chat. During one of the breaks, Elliot suggested they race the jet skis to a large rock jutting out of the water a few hundred yards away. Although unsure of himself, Connor was never one to back away from a challenge and accept it. They lined their jet skis up, counted down, and took off slowly toward the rocks. They had agreed that they would stop a safe distance from the stones, but an issue occurred when Connor noticed his jet ski was not behaving the same way as before. It was moving up from the surface of the water and bobbing aggressively. He tried to signal Elliot to stop but could not get the message across because of the splashing water around them. In a fraction of a second, Connor's hands lost their grip on the jet ski's handles as it flung itself out of the water and rotated backward, landing him on his back. The pain of striking the water surface was bad enough, but the real pain came when he realized that the water around the rocks they were racing to was much more shallow than expected with more rocks under the surface. Connor broke his femur on one of the rocks while falling into the water, making him scream in agony. Elliot saw what happened and steered toward Connor, asking him if he was all right. Through moans and tears, he explained what happened to his friend and clung to the side of the jet ski, legs dangling under the surface. The sea salt stung his wound, which throbbed with tremendous pain but neither registered much blood in the water. As Connor tried to calm down from breaking his leg, he was startled by the painful feeling of sandpaper being dragged across his belly. Something to note about sharks is that their skin is extremely rough and covered in shield scales, tiny tooth-like protrusions that will damage things a shark bumps into. Connor did not know this and panicked at the alien and painful feeling on his skin this made him slip from the jet ski and fall under the surface, where he saw a massive shark circling in his blood and tilting itself up toward him. He immediately let go of his jet ski and begged Elliot to pull him up, screaming about the shark and how it was coming for him. Just as Elliot grabbed his arm to pull him up, 
Connor screamed and was pulled below the surface again, with nothing holding him up but Elliot's struggling hand. Under the surface, Connor's eyes were stung by the salty water, and he couldn't see anything. He could only feel the shark's sharp teeth grinding against the bones of his shin. The pain was immense, and he tried to kick the shark away, but his broken femur did not allow that. He tried reaching for the shark's snout, but it was out of his reach. Within a second, he felt his bones snap, and he released his breath as he let out an agonizing scream. The pressure on his shin was gone, and he felt pulled from the water. Elliot hoisted Connor on the jet ski and immediately set for the shore, where someone would help them. He had to hurry as Connor was profusely losing blood, but he couldn't risk him falling in the water again. One mistake could mean the shark would return and finish the job. Elliot and Connor reached the shoreline within a few minutes. The crowd at the beach scrambled to help the pair, and they managed to get Connor to safety and tie his leg stump off with a tourniquet. Hope was fleeting, however, as the only thing keeping Connor conscious was the adrenaline of the incident, and the real pain was starting to show. Shortly after reaching the shore, the ambulance took the three friends to the nearest hospital so Connor could be treated. His lower leg was lost and his femur was snapped clean in half and it was clear that he would not leave the hospital soon. It took two weeks for him to stabilize and regain some strength to endure the flight home where he would need further treatment. All in all, it took Connor many years to learn to walk with a prosthesis and he said he would avoid anything deeper than a pond from then on out. The shark was eventually recognized as a tiger shark and was relocated from the area of the incident. This next haunting attack occurred in Florida, more specifically off the coast of the Florida Keys, where a fisherman named Alfred Moore found himself the prey of a massive great white shark, bigger than he had ever seen. Alfred had been a fisherman for 15 years and was well-versed in commercial and hobbyist fishing. He spent most of his time on the Keys, but he also did some tours of other American shores and more exotic places such as Africa and Thailand. Fishing was always a part of his life, and this encounter would send his life on a downward spiral, impossible to come back from. Alfred woke up in the morning of July 2, 1999, and decided that the weather looked fantastic for fishing. He had rarely caught mahi-mahi and decided that that day would be the day. After saying goodbye to his wife, he left his house and went to the beach where his boat was docked. On the way to the docks, Alfred met one of his fishing friends, Adam, who asked if he could tag along for the day. Alfred said he needed to clear his head and wanted to fish alone. Adam accepted. Later, Alfred reminded himself that things might have turned out much differently if he had accepted his friend's suggestion. It was a two-man boat, but Alfred handled it just fine on his own. He loaded up his equipment and set sail, sailing for approximately 20 minutes before he arrived at his destination. He heard that Mahi Mahi often congregated around that point and stopped his boat. Although fishing usually took a long time, he enjoyed his own company and the company of a few cold beers in his cooler. He set up his gear and fishing poles, letting two hang off the boat to lure in the fish. As the day dragged on and the beer in his cooler was reduced to just a couple of cans, by all accounts, he was inebriated. The day was going according to plan. He managed to snag a few mahi-mahis and was very happy about it, but he wanted to catch a few more fish for his freezer when both lines tightened simultaneously. He reeled each one in bit by bit, slowly pulling the fish to the surface and tiring them out. It took about five minutes, but it was no issue for Alfred. He had done this a hundred times before. However, things started to go wrong when Alfred realized the line on the right suddenly tightened and pulling in became much easier. As it got to the surface, Alfred saw that it was another mahi-mahi, but it was only half of the fish. It was easily 30 pounds, and something bit it in half without effort. He realized something dangerous was in the water, and it was time to pack up, so he moved forward and pulled the right line into the boat 
then drew his attention to the leftmost line. It was caught under the boat, so he had to cut the line. As he bent down to cut the line where it met the water's surface, he saw a dark shape immediately underneath him for a split second before his vision was obstructed by a massive splash of water followed by the worst searing pain he had ever felt in his life. He looked in front of himself, eyes still stinging from the salt water as he barely held on to the edge of the boat, and there it was, a great white shark latched onto his arm. He screamed in pain and protest, but the beast disappeared as soon as it appeared, taking with it a bloody trophy. Alfred fell back into the boat as the blood from his arm sprayed everywhere, staining the white lining of the boat grotesquely. He hit his head on one of the walls, but managed to retain his consciousness. As he looked at the bloody stump, the shark left over for him, all of the pain came rushing back, and he screamed again. He had to think quickly, so he took a bunch of spare fishing lines and messily sprawled it around his arm, whimpering as he did so. He pulled it tight with his teeth, as tight as it would go. While the bleeding did not stop completely, he had slowed it down enough to shakily get up on his feet and start the boat's engine up again. Each passing second was agony as the salt of the water stung his wound and his eyes but he had to focus on getting back to shore and medical assistance. Against all odds, he did not pass out from the blood loss or the pain and managed to endure the 20 plus minutes it took to get back to shore. As he did, he saw that there weren't that many people on the beach, or at least not near the docks where he usually left his boat. He switched the ignition off and clambered to the dock. He could feel his vision blurry, but he had to find someone. At the edge of the dock, he could see a small cafe he would visit sometimes and focused all his energy on getting there. The last thing he remembered was the feeling of wind on his face as he fell to the cold tiled floor of the cafe. A day later, Alfred woke up in a hospital bed to the presence of his wife and their daughter, who rushed over to his side from another city nearby. They hugged him gently and told him that one of the employees in the cafe called an ambulance that took him to the hospital. He thanked them for being by his side all that time, but the blood left his face again when he remembered that the shark had taken most of his forearm, leaving him debilitated and unable to fish as he used to. It took him a few weeks to get used to the absence of his arm, but that didn't stop him from embracing this change as an opportunity and opening a fishing shop where he taught both the basics of fishing and what to be careful about. The shark was never seen there again. Best friends Eli and Ayla were on a trip to Hawaii for their summer vacation. Their favorite hobby together was going to beaches and snorkeling, since the two have developed a passion for seeing aquatic animals and documenting them every single time. This time, they decided to fly to Hawaii and visit the beautiful beaches of Oahu, where they could go snorkeling with vast coral reefs and different fish species. However, they wanted to try something new, free diving with sharks. Some beaches in Oahu offer shark diving in a cage, but one particular beach offers shark diving without using a cell, but rather going free diving or snorkeling along with the sharks. Ayla initially hesitated, but Eli encouraged her to challenge herself and face her fears. As they arrived at the beach in Oahu, they were greeted by the friendly locals and staff surrounding the place. Not only that, they were welcomed by the beautiful view of crystal clear waters and white sand beaches, making them even more excited for their awaiting adventure underneath the waters. They also met a local freediving instructor named Calais who would be their guide when they went free diving the next day. Eli and Ayla headed to their hotel first to rest, as Kalei accommodated them and told them to call him when they needed help. The two couldn't contain their excitement as they couldn't sleep, knowing that tomorrow they'll be having one of the wildest aquatic adventures they could ever experience. When the next day came, Eli and Ayla were picked up by Kalei from their hotel to the beach. Kalei will accompany them on their free diving adventure and tell them everything they need to know when swimming with sharks. 
Pillay also said that the number one rule was not to panic, since sharks can sense panic and fear. After the mini orientation with Kalei, Eli and Ayla grabbed their gear as Kalei took them to their free diving spot using a small boat. When they reached the area, they immediately went under the water. They were welcomed by the mesmerizing sight of the deep blue sea surrounding them. Additionally, Kalei warned them that sharks might approach them at any time, so they should keep swimming in case that happens. Ayla became nervous as Eli held her hand when he noticed his friend. He gave a thumbs up sign to Ayla to cheer her up. Ayla smiled at him and went on with their free diving. Kalei, who was in front of them to serve as their guide, turned around and gave them a thumbs up as he could see a shark approaching them at a distance. Eli swam over to Ayla and tapped her back to cheer her up. The shark was fast approaching and Eli was excited. However, Ayla couldn't stop worrying about what kind of shark was coming at them right at that moment. Kalei, who was having difficulty identifying what type of shark it was, was shocked when it was right in front of them. And turns out, it was a tiger shark, which was unexpected. Ayla became terrified of how big the tiger shark looked. Kalei immediately went over to calm her down and told her to stay still since the shark was circling them. Eli was relaxed as he knew that Kalei was with them, but little did he know that Kalei was also nervous since it was not common for him to swim with the tiger shark. Everything was going fine until the shark decided to swim underneath Ayla, which caused her to panic and kick the shark. The tiger shark was not pleased and felt threatened, causing it to bite Ayla's left leg. Kalei and Eli were shocked as the tiger shark continued to bite Ayla's leg, shaking her body through the water and trying to rip her leg off. Ayla was screaming underwater as Kalei headed over to the shark to kick it with his bare feet, while Eli held Ayla's body and tried to hold it to calm her down. The tiger shark kept biting Ayla's leg and Kalei used all his strength to kick and punch its face and gills. When the right moment came, Kalei poked the shark's eye, which caused it to flinch and swim away from them as fast as possible. After the attack, they immediately helped carry Ayla out of the water and into the small boat to get help. As they reached the shore, Ayla fell unconscious. She was then taken to a hospital to get medical attention for the bite wound on her left leg. She survived the attack but had to spend a long time in the hospital to recover from the injury that the shark caused. The sun was setting on a warm July evening in 2015, as six teenagers made their way down to the secluded bay on the eastern coast of Florida. The subjects of this group that found themselves amid blood and teeth are Eric and Kenneth Lang, two brothers whose idea was to go on a trip across Florida. The group consisted of four boys and two girls in their late teens. They had been planning this trip for weeks, eager to explore the lesser-known beaches of the state. The teenagers had heard about the beautiful bay on the internet and were excited to check it out. However, they had been warned to stay away from the area due to a recent spike of shark sightings. But the group ignored the warnings, believing the sightings were exaggerated and it was safe. They chose to go to the bay in the very early hours of the morning to avoid getting told off by someone who took the warning seriously. As they waded into the still cold waters of the bay, they talked among themselves and joked about their memories of the trip up to that point. Although cold, the water was quite enjoyable, so the group had no worries. Eric and Kenneth were talking about their parents' concern about considering going on that trip when Eric yelped in pain and surprise. His brother asked him what the matter was, and he pulled his leg up to the surface to reveal it was roughed up as if someone had dragged sandpaper across it. They didn't understand what could have done it, but the pain wasn't too bad. They decided to swim in more shallow water, so they started back. As they were swimming, Kenneth noticed a dark shape underneath them. Nervous, he told his brother to swim faster as they approached the group. As he said that, he saw a large dorsal fin cut through the water and dip down again, only to feel a violent blow to his stomach. The wind was knocked out of him, and he fought to take a breath of air. 
but it came along with some salt water, causing him to stop swimming. Eric looked back and at that moment felt the worst pain of his life as the tiger shark assaulting them clamped onto his cap with tremendous force. He screamed, alerting the rest of the group to the situation. They froze in place and didn't know what to do. One started swimming toward them, only to be dragged back by the other boy. The girls fled the scene. It was later revealed that they ran to the town to call for help, while the two remaining boys stood and watched the scene unfold. Eric flailed in the water and tried to kick the shark away with his free leg, but it was not intending to let go anytime soon. Kenneth acted on sheer adrenaline and instinct, diving into the water to get the shark off his brother. He tried pulling it off, but it didn't work, so he grabbed its head and started kneeing it in the snout. It let go after that point. The shark darted towards the group, its jaws wide open. One of the boys, Alex, tried to swim away, but was quickly pulled underwater by the massive predator. The other teenagers screamed as they watched in horror as the shark thrashed its massive body in the water. The girls in the group arrived back at the scene with a fisherman in tow. He understood the area well and intended to help the boys as best he could while the ambulance arrived. The fisherman was taking some harpoons to be sharpened and maintained when the girls ran up to him screaming and crying, so he immediately came to their aid. With one harpoon in his hand, he jumped into the water and swam toward the boys, calling them to swim toward him. They did so, but not without their share of discomfort. Eric could feel his bones grinding against each other with each kick in the water, and Kenneth was barely breathing because of swallowing so much water before. They met at the halfway point, and the fisherman grabbed hold of Eric and started swimming back to shore with both of the boys. At that moment, the shark returned, choosing Kenneth to rip its next morsel off. He was dragged under the water and thrashed around by the shark, only to be released after a few moments. He rushed to swim back to the surface, but the shark was eager for more meat and bit into his upper thigh harder than before. He let out all of the air in his lungs in an attempt to scream, and he could feel his consciousness fading fast. The last thing he saw before he breathed air in again was the flash of the fisherman's harpoon passing his head and jamming itself straight into the shark's snout. The fisherman let Eric swim back to shore on his own to help Kenneth, and just in time at that. Kenneth remembered feeling the pain in his thigh ease up a bit and the feeling of running water as he was dragged back to the surface by the man. Both of them resurfaced and took massive breaths of air, much to Kenneth's relief. Eric was lying on the beach in tremendous pain, but he never kept his eyes off where the fisherman dove to find his brother. He could hear the ambulance in the distance and knew everything depended on them returning to shore. Should they succeed, the nightmare would be over. Kenneth could feel himself slowly regaining consciousness, but was still dizzy because of the blood loss. They kicked through the water as much as they could eventually reaching the point where they could stand up and walk back to shore. As soon as he stood, Kenneth collapsed, and the fisherman hoisted him up on his shoulder. He carried the young boy back to his brother and laid him beside him. The sound of the ambulance was getting louder and louder, so all they could do was wait. The vehicle eventually arrived and they loaded the teenagers into it, tending to their wounds on the way there. As they left their sight, the fishermen scorned the rest of the group for not heeding the official warnings and acting like idiots. He didn't let them leave and insisted on calling their parents to update them on the situation. They protested but understood their lives were in question, so they gave in. Eric and Kenneth's parents immediately rushed to the bay to see their sons, but the drive was over an hour away. When they got to the hospital, their mother demanded to see her sons. She was updated on their situation and was informed that Eric would likely be okay. But Kenneth had suffered brain damage due to blood loss and lack of oxygen. He was stable but unresponsive. After waiting a few days, the doctors informed the family that both boys would pull through, although Kenneth's motor functions and speech would be irreparably distorted. The boys continued their lives as best as they could and their parents never reprimanded them for their irresponsible decision to swim in that bay. They were just happy their sons were alive.